Haile Selassie I Gies. Kadamawi Hela Slaze, born Lij Tafari Makanan, Amharic pronunciation, Hal Sl Lays, listen, of July 1892 to 27 August 1975, was Ethiopian regent from 1916 to 1930 and emperor from 1930 to 1974. He is a defining figure in Ethiopian history. He was a member of the Solomonic dynasty who traced his lineage to Emperor Menelik I via his Shiwan royal ancestors as a great grandson of King Sahil Selassie. Haile Selassie's father was Makanan Wald Michael Gudessa, and his mother was Yashimabed Ali Abba Jafar. His internationalist views led to Ethiopia becoming a charter member of the United Nations, and his political thought and experience in promoting multilateralism and collective security have proved seminal and enduring. At the League of Nations in 1936, the Emperor condemned the use of chemical weapons by Italy against his people during the Second Italo-Ethiopian War, his suppression of rebellions among the landed aristocracy the Mesophant, which consistently opposed his reforms, as well as what some critics perceived to be Ethiopia's failure to modernize rapidly enough, earned him criticism among some contemporaries and historians. During his rule the Harari people were ethnically cleansed from the Harari region. His regime was also criticized by human rights groups, such as Human Rights Watch, as autocratic and illiberal. Among the Rastafari movement, whose followers are estimated to number between 700,000 and 1 million, Haile Selassie is revered as the returned Messiah of the Bible, God incarnate. Beginning in Jamaica in the 1930s, the Rastafari movement perceives Haile Selassie as a messianic figure who will lead a future golden age of eternal peace, righteousness, and prosperity. Haile Selassie was an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian throughout his life. The 1973 famine in Ethiopia led to Haile Selassie's eventual removal from the throne. He died on 27 August 1975 at the age of 83, following a coup d'état. Name Haile Selassie was known as a child as Lij Tafari Makanan Amharic Lij to Ferry Makonan. Lij is translated as child and serves to indicate that a youth is of noble blood. His given name, Tafari, means one who is respected or feared. Like most Ethiopians, his personal name Tafari is followed by that of his father Makanan and rarely that of his grandfather Woldemichael. His Gies name Haile Selassie was given to him at his infant baptism and adopted again as part of his regnal name in 1930. As governor of Harar, he became known as Ras Tafari Makanan Listen. Ras is translated as head and is a rank of nobility equivalent to duke, though it is often rendered in translation as prince. In 1916, Empress Zebditu I appointed him to the position of Balamulu Sultan Endereis Regent Plenipotentiary. In 1928, she granted him the throne of Shiwa, elevating his title to Negus or king. On 2 November 1930, after the death of Empress Zebditu, Tafari was crowned Nagusa Nagast, literally King of Kings, rendered in English as Emperor. Upon his ascension, he took as his regnal name Haile Selassie I. Haile means in Gies, power of, and Selassie means Trinity. Therefore Haile Selassie roughly translates to power of the Trinity. Haile Selassie's full title in office was by the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, King of Kings of Ethiopia, Elect of God." This title reflects Ethiopian dynastic traditions, which hold that all monarchs must trace their lineage to Menelik I, who was the offspring of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. To Ethiopians, Haile Selassie has been known by many names, including Janhoi, Talik Mary, and Abba Tekel. The Rastafari movement employs many of these appellations, also referring to him as Ja, Ja Ja, Ja Rastafari, and him the abbreviation of His Imperial Majesty. Biography Early life Haile Selassie's royal line through his father's mother descended from Sahil Selassie. He was born on 23 July 1892, in the village of Ahersa Guro, in the Harar province of Ethiopia. His mother was Woiziro, Lady, Yashimabet Ali Abba Jafar, daughter of the renowned Oromo ruler of Wallo province de Jasmak Ali Abba Jafar. His maternal grandmother was of Grage heritage. 
Tafari's father was Ras Makanan Woldemichael Gudessa, the governor of Harar. Ras Makanan served as a general in the First Italo Ethiopian War, playing a key role at the Battle of Adwa. He too was paternally Oromo but maternally Amhara. Haile Selassie was thus able to ascend to the imperial throne through his paternal grandmother, Woiziro Tenenwerk Sahil Selassie, who was an aunt of Emperor Menelik II and daughter of Negus Sahil Selassie of Shewa. As such, Haile Selassie claimed direct descent from Makeda, the Queen of Sheba, and King Solomon of ancient Israel. Ras Makanan arranged for Tafari as well as his first cousin, Imru Haile Selassie, to receive instruction in Harar from Abba Samuel Wald Kahan, an Ethiopian Capuchin monk, and from Dr. Vitalian, a surgeon from Guadeloupe. Tafari was named Dejazmok, literally, Commander of the Gate, roughly equivalent to Count. At the age of 13, on the 1st of November 1905. Shortly thereafter, his father Ross McConnon died at Culebi in 1906. Topic: <laughs> Governorship. Tafari assumed the titular governorship of Salale in 1906, a realm of marginal importance, but one that enabled him to continue his studies. In 1907, he was appointed governor over part of the province of Sadamo. It is alleged that during his late teens, Haile Selassie was married to Woiziro Altayech, and that from this union, his daughter Princess Romainwork was born. Following the death of his brother Yelma in 1907, the governorate of Harar was left vacant, and its administration was left to Menelik's loyal general, De Jasmok Balka Safo. Balka Safo's administration of Harar was ineffective, and so during the last illness of Menelik II, and the brief reign of Empress Taitu Bidal, Tafari was made governor of Harar in 1910 or 1911. 11, on 3 August, he married Menon Asfa of Ambassal, niece of the heir to the throne Lij Iyasu. Regency The extent to which Tafari Makanan contributed to the movement that would come to depose Iyasu V has been discussed extensively, particularly in Haile Selassie's own detailed account of the matter. Iyasu V, or Lij Iyasu, was the designated but uncrowned emperor of Ethiopia from 1913 to 1916. Iyasu's reputation for scandalous behavior and a disrespectful attitude towards the nobles at the court of his grandfather, Menelik II, damaged his reputation. Iyasu's flirtation with Islam was considered treasonous among the Ethiopian Orthodox Christian leadership of the empire. On 27 September 1916, Iyasu was deposed, contributing to the movement that deposed Iyasu were conservatives such as Fitorari Habte Jiorgis, Menelik II's longtime minister of war. The movement to depose Iyasu preferred Tafari, as he attracted support from both progressive and conservative factions. Ultimately, Iyasu was deposed on the grounds of conversion to Islam. In his place, the daughter of Menelik II the aunt of Iyasu was named Empress Zebditu, while Tafari was elevated to the rank of Ras and was made heir apparent and crown prince. In the power arrangement that followed, Tafari accepted the role of regent plenipotentiary Balamulu Indires and became the de facto ruler of the Ethiopian Empire Mangista Idiopia. Zebditu would govern while Tafari would administer. While Iyasu had been deposed on 27 September 1916, on 8 October he managed to escape into the Agaden Desert and his father, Negus Michael of Wallo, had time to come to his aid. On 27 October, Negus Michael and his army met an army under Fitorari Habte Jiorgis loyal to Zebditu and Tafari. During the Battle of Sigali, Negus Michael was defeated and captured. Any chance that Iyasu would regain the throne was ended and he went into hiding. On the 11th of January 1921, after avoiding capture for about five years, Iyasu was taken into custody by Gugza Araya Selassie. On the 11th of February 1917, the coronation for Zebditu took place. She pledged to rule justly through her regent, Tafari. While Tafari was the more visible of the two, Zebditu was far from an honorary ruler. Her position required that she arbitrate the claims of competing factions. In other words, she had the last word. Tafari carried the burden of daily administration but, because his position was relatively weak, this was often an exercise in futility for him. Initially his personal army was poorly equipped, his finances were limited, and he had little leverage to withstand the combined influence of the empress, the minister of war, or the provincial governors. During his regency, the new crown prince developed the policy of cautious modernization initiated by Menelik II. 
Also, during this time, he survived the 1918 flu pandemic, having come down with the illness. He secured Ethiopia's admission to the League of Nations in 1923 by promising to eradicate slavery. Each emperor since Tedros II had issued proclamations to halt slavery, but without effect. The internationally scorned practice persisted well into Haile Selassie's reign with an estimated 2 million slaves in Ethiopia in the early 1930s. Topic: <laughs> Travel abroad. In 1924, Rastafari toured Europe and the Middle East visiting Jerusalem, Alexandria, Paris, Brussels, Amsterdam, Stockholm, London, Geneva, and Athens. With him on his tour was a group that included Ras Siam Mangasha of Western Tigray Province, Ras Hailu Tekel Hamanat of Gojjam Province, Ras Malageta Yegazu of Alubaber Province, Ras Makanan in Delkachu, and Blatangata Haroi Weld Seles. The primary goal of the trip to Europe was for Ethiopia to gain access to the sea. In Paris, Tafari was to find out from the French Foreign Ministry that this goal would not be realized. However, failing this, he and his retinue inspected schools, hospitals, factories, and churches. Although patterning many reforms after European models, Tafari remained wary of European pressure. To guard against economic imperialism, Tafari required that all enterprises have at least partial local ownership. Of his modernization campaign, he remarked, We need European progress only because we are surrounded by it. That is at once a benefit and a misfortune. Throughout Tafari's travels in Europe, the Levant, and Egypt, he and his entourage were greeted with enthusiasm and fascination. He was accompanied by Siam Mangasha and Hailu Tekel Hamanat who, like Tafari, were sons of generals who contributed to the victorious war against Italy a quarter century earlier at the Battle of ADWA. Another member of his entourage, Malageta Yegazu, actually fought at ADWA as a young man. The «Oriental dignity» of the Ethiopians and their «rich, picturesque court dress» were sensationalized in the media. Among his entourage he even included a pride of lions, which he distributed as gifts to President Alexander Millerand and Prime Minister Raymond Poincaré of France, to King George V of the United Kingdom, and to the Zoological Garden Jardin Zoologique of Paris. As one historian noted, "...rarely can a tour have inspired so many anecdotes." In return for two lions, the United Kingdom presented Tafari with the imperial crown of Emperor Tedros II for its safe return to Empress Zevditu. The crown had been taken by Robert Napier during the 1868 expedition to Abyssinia. In this period, the crown prince visited the Armenian monastery of Jerusalem. There, he adopted 40 Armenian orphans, Arba Liyok, 40 children, who had lost their parents in Ottoman massacres. Tafari arranged for the musical education of the youths, and they came to form the Imperial Brass Band. Topic. King and Emperor Tafari's authority was challenged in 1928 when Dejazmach Balka Safo went to Addis Ababa with a sizable armed force. When Tafari consolidated his hold over the provinces, many of Menelik's appointees refused to abide by the new regulations. Balka Safo, the governor Shum of Kafi rich Sadamo province, was particularly troublesome. The revenues he remitted to the central government did not reflect the accrued profits and Tafari recalled him to Addis Ababa. The old man came in high dudgeon and, insultingly, with a large army. The Dejazmach paid homage to Empress Zebditu, but snubbed Tafari. On 18 February, while Balka Safo and his personal bodyguard were in Addis Ababa, Tafari had Ras Kassa Haile Darj buy off his army and arranged to have him displaced as the Shum of Sadamo province by Baru Wald Gabriel who himself was replaced by Desta Damchu. Even so, the gesture of Balka Safo empowered Empress Zevditu politically and she attempted to have Tafari tried for treason. He was tried for his benevolent dealings with Italy including a 20-year peace accord which was signed on 2 August. In September, a group of palace reactionaries including some courtiers of the Empress, made a final bid to get rid of Tafari. The attempted coup d'état was tragic in its origins and comic in its end. When confronted by Tafari and a company of his troops, the ringleaders of the coup took refuge on the palace grounds in Menelik's mausoleum. Tafari and his men surrounded them only to be surrounded themselves by the personal guard of Zebditu. More of Tafari's khaki clad soldiers arrived and, with superiority of arms, decided the outcome in his favor. Popular support, as well as the support of the police, remained with Tafari. 
Ultimately, the Empress relented and, on 7 October 1928, she crowned Tafari as Negus Amharic king. The crowning of Tafari as king was controversial. He occupied the same territory as the Empress rather than going off to a regional kingdom of the empire. Two monarchs, even with one being the vassal and the other the emperor in this case Empress, had never occupied the same location as their seat in Ethiopian history. Conservatives agitated to redress this perceived insult to the dignity of the crown, leading to the rebellion of Ras Gugzawel. Gugzawel was the husband of the Empress and the Shum of Begemder province. In early 1930, he raised an army and marched it from his governorate at Gondar towards Addis Ababa. On 31 March 1930, Gugzawel was met by forces loyal to Negus Tafari and was defeated at the Battle of Ancham. Gugzawel was killed in action. News of Gugzawel's defeat and death had hardly spread through Addis Ababa when the Empress died suddenly on 2 April 1930. Although it was long rumored that the Empress was poisoned upon the defeat of her husband, or alternately that she died from shock upon hearing of the death of her estranged yet beloved husband, it has since been documented that the Empress succumbed to a flu-like fever and complications from diabetes. With the passing of Zebditu, Tafari himself rose to emperor and was proclaimed Negus Negus Z Idiopia, King of Kings of Ethiopia. He was crowned on 2 November 1930, at Addis Ababa's Cathedral of St. George. The coronation was by all accounts, a most splendid affair, and it was attended by royals and dignitaries from all over the world. Among those in attendance were George V's son the Duke of Gloucester, Marshal Franchet Desperi of France, and the Prince of Udine representing the King of Italy. Emissaries from the United States, Egypt, Turkey, Sweden, Belgium, and Japan were also present. British author Evelyn Waugh was also present, penning a contemporary report on the event, and American travel lecturer Burton Holmes shot the only known film footage of the event. One newspaper report suggested that the celebration may have incurred a cost in excess of $3 million. Many of those in attendance received lavish gifts. In one instance, the Christian emperor even sent a gold encased Bible to an American bishop who had not attended the coronation, but who had dedicated a prayer to the emperor on the day of the coronation. Haile Selassie introduced Ethiopia's first written constitution on 16 July 1931, providing for a bicameral legislature. The constitution kept power in the hands of the nobility, but it did establish democratic standards among the nobility, envisaging a transition to democratic rule, it would prevail, "...until the people are in a position to elect themselves." The constitution limited the succession to the throne to the descendants of Haile Selassie, a point that met with the disapprobation of other dynastic princes, including the princes of Tigray and even the emperor's loyal cousin, Ras Kassa Haile Darj. In 1932, the Sultanate of Jimma was formally absorbed into Ethiopia following the death of Sultan Abba Jafar II of Jimma. Topic: <laughs> Conflict with Italy. Ethiopia became the target of renewed Italian imperialist designs in the 1930s. Benito Mussolini's fascist regime was keen to avenge the military defeats Italy had suffered to Ethiopia in the First Italo-Abyssinian War, and to efface the failed attempt by «liberal» Italy to conquer the country, as epitomized by the defeat at ADWA. A conquest of Ethiopia could also empower the cause of fascism and embolden its rhetoric of empire. Ethiopia would also provide a bridge between Italy's Eritrean and Italian Somaliland possessions. Ethiopia's position in the League of Nations did not dissuade the Italians from invading in 1935, the collective security envisaged by the League proved useless, and a scandal erupted when the Hore Laval Pact revealed that Ethiopia's League allies were scheming to appease Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Mobilization Following the 5 December 1934 Italian invasion of Ethiopia at Welwil, Agaden province, Haile Selassie joined his northern armies and set up headquarters at Des in Wallo province. He issued his mobilization order on 3 October 1935. If you withhold from your country Ethiopia the death from cough or head cold of which you would otherwise die, refusing to resist in your district, in your patrimony, and in your home our enemy who is coming from a distant country to attack us, and if you persist in not shedding your blood, you will be rebuked for it by your Creator and will be cursed by your offspring. 
Hence, without cooling your heart of accustomed valor, there emerges your decision to fight fiercely, mindful of your history that will last far into the future. If on your march you touch any property inside houses or cattle and crops outside, not even grass, straw, and dung excluded, it is like killing your brother who is dying with you. You, countrymen, living at the various access routes, set up a market for the army at the places where it is camping and on the day your district governor will indicate to you, lest the soldiers campaigning for Ethiopia's liberty should experience difficulty. You will not be charged excise duty, until the end of the campaign, for anything you are marketing at the military camps, I have granted you remission, after you have been ordered to go to war, but are then idly missing from the campaign, and when you are seized by the local chief or by an accuser, you will have punishment inflicted upon your inherited land, your property, and your body, to the accuser I shall grant a third of your property. On 19 October 1935, Haile Selassie gave more precise orders for his army to his commander-in-chief, Ras Kassa. When you set up tents, it is to be in caves and by trees and in a wood, if the place happens to be adjoining to these and separated in the various platoons. Tents are to be set up at a distance of 30 cubits from each other. When an aeroplane is sighted, one should leave large open roads and wide meadows and march in valleys and trenches and by zigzag routes, along places which have trees and woods. When an aeroplane comes to drop bombs, it will not suit it to do so unless it comes down to about 100 meters, hence when it flies low for such action, one should fire a volley with a good and very long gun and then quickly disperse. When three or four bullets have hit it, the aeroplane is bound to fall down. But let only those fire who have been ordered to shoot with a weapon that has been selected for such firing, for if everyone shoots who possesses a gun, there is no advantage in this except to waste bullets and to disclose the men's whereabouts. Lest the aeroplane, when rising again, should detect the whereabouts of those who are dispersed, it is well to remain cautiously scattered as long as it is still fairly close. In time of war it suits the enemy to aim his guns at adorned shields, ornaments, silver and gold cloaks, silk shirts and all similar things. Whether one possesses a jacket or not, it is best to wear a narrow-sleeved shirt with faded colors. When we return, with God's help, you can wear your gold and silver decorations then. Now it is time to go and fight. We offer you all these words of advice in the hope that no great harm should befall you through lack of caution. At the same time, we are glad to assure you that in time of war, we are ready to shed our blood in your midst for the sake of Ethiopia's freedom. Compared to the Ethiopians, the Italians had an advanced, modern military which included a large air force. The Italians would also come to employ chemical weapons extensively throughout the conflict, even targeting Red Cross field hospitals in violation of the Geneva Conventions. Topic. Progress of the war Starting in early October 1935, the Italians invaded Ethiopia. But, by November, the pace of invasion had slowed appreciably and Haile Selassie's northern armies were able to launch what was known as the Christmas Offensive. During this offensive, the Italians were forced back in places and put on the defensive. In early 1936, the First Battle of Tembian stopped the progress of the Ethiopian offensive and the Italians were ready to continue their offensive. Following the defeat and destruction of the northern Ethiopian armies at the Battle of Amba Aradam, the Second Battle of Tembian, and the Battle of Shire, Haile Selassie took the field with the last Ethiopian army on the northern front. On 31 March 1936, he launched a counterattack against the Italians himself at the Battle of Mechu in southern Tigray. The emperor's army was defeated and retreated in disarray. As Haile Selassie's army withdrew, the Italians attacked from the air along with rebellious Raya and Azebo tribesmen on the ground, who were armed and paid by the Italians. Haile Selassie made a solitary pilgrimage to the churches at Lalibela, at considerable risk of capture, before returning to his capital. After a stormy session of the Council of State, it was agreed that because Addis Ababa could not be defended, the government would relocate to the southern town of Gore, and that in the interest of preserving the imperial house, the emperor's wife Menon Asfa and the rest of the imperial family should immediately depart for French Somaliland, and from there continue on to Jerusalem. Topic. Exile debate After further debate as to whether Haile Selassie should go to Gore or accompany his family into exile, it was agreed that he should leave Ethiopia with his family and present the case of Ethiopia to the League of Nations at Geneva. 
The decision was not unanimous and several participants, including the nobleman Blada Tekel Wald Hawariat, strenuously objected to the idea of an Ethiopian monarch fleeing before an invading force. Haile Selassie appointed his cousin Ras Imru Haile Selassie as prince regent in his absence, departing with his family for French Somaliland on 2 May 1936. On 5 May, Marshal Pietro Badoglio led Italian troops into Addis Ababa, and Mussolini declared Ethiopia an Italian province. Victor Emmanuel III was proclaimed as the new emperor of Ethiopia. On the previous day, the Ethiopian exiles had left French Somaliland aboard the British cruiser HMS Enterprise. They were bound for Jerusalem in the British Mandate of Palestine, where the Ethiopian royal family maintained a residence. The imperial family disembarked at Haifa and then went on to Jerusalem. Once there, Haile Selassie and his retinue prepared to make their case at Geneva. The choice of Jerusalem was highly symbolic, since the Solomonic dynasty claimed descent from the House of David. Leaving the Holy Land, Haile Selassie and his entourage sailed aboard the British cruiser HMS Cape Town for Gibraltar, where he stayed at the Rock Hotel. From Gibraltar, the exiles were transferred to an ordinary liner. By doing this, the government of the United Kingdom was spared the expense of a state reception. Topic. Collective Security and the League of Nations, 1936 Mussolini, upon invading Ethiopia, had promptly declared his own Italian Empire because the League of Nations afforded Haile Selassie the opportunity to address the assembly. Italy even withdrew its League delegation on the 12th of May 1936. It was in this context that Haile Selassie walked into the hall of the League of Nations, introduced by the president of the assembly as His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor of Ethiopia, Sa Majeste Imperiali, L'Empereur d'Ethiopie. The introduction caused a great many Italian journalists in the galleries to erupt into jeering, heckling, and whistling. As it turned out, they had earlier been issued whistles by Mussolini's son-in-law, Count Galeazzo Ciano. The Romanian delegate, Nicolae Ticulescu, famously jumped to his feet in response and cried, To the door with the savages! And the offending journalists were removed from the hall. Haile Selassie waited calmly for the hall to be cleared, and responded, Majestically! with a speech sometimes considered among the most stirring of the 20th century, although fluent in French, the working language of the League, Haile Selassie chose to deliver his historic speech in his native Amharic. He asserted that, because his confidence in the League was absolute, his people were now being slaughtered. He pointed out that the same European states that found in Ethiopia's favor at the League of Nations were refusing Ethiopia credit and materiel while aiding Italy, which was employing chemical weapons on military and civilian targets alike. It was at the time when the operations for the encircling of Makale were taking place that the Italian command, fearing a rout, followed the procedure which it is now my duty to denounce to the world. Special sprayers were installed on board aircraft so that they could vaporize, over vast areas of territory, a fine, death-dealing rain. Groups of 9, 15, 18 aircraft followed one another so that the fog issuing from them formed a continuous sheet. It was thus that, as from the end of January 1936, soldiers, women, children, cattle, rivers, lakes, and pastures were drenched continually with this deadly rain. In order to kill off systematically all living creatures, in order to more surely poison waters and pastures, the Italian command made its aircraft pass over and over again. That was its chief method of warfare. Noting that his own, small people of 12 million inhabitants, without arms, without resources, could never withstand an attack by a large power such as Italy, with its 42 million people and unlimited quantities of the most death-dealing weapons. He contended that all small states were threatened by the aggression, and that all small states were in effect reduced to vassal states in the absence of collective action. He admonished the League that, God and history will remember your judgment. It is collective security, it is the very existence of the League of Nations. It is the confidence that each state is to place in international treaties, in a word, it is international morality that is at stake. Have the signatures appended to a treaty value only in so far as the signatory powers have a personal, direct and immediate interest involved? The speech made the emperor an icon for anti-fascists around the world, and time named him, Man of the Year. He failed, however, to get what he most needed, the League agreed to only partial and ineffective sanctions on Italy. 
Only six nations in 1937 did not recognize Italy's occupation, China, New Zealand, the Soviet Union, the Republic of Spain, Mexico and the United States. Exile Haile Selassie spent his exile years 1936 in Bath, England, in Fairfield House, which he bought. The Emperor and Casa Haile Darge took morning walks together behind the high walls of the 14-room Georgian house. Haile Selassie's favorite reading was, "...diplomatic history." But most of his serious hours were occupied with the 90,000-word story of his life that he was laboriously writing in Amharic. Prior to Fairfield House, he briefly stayed at Warren's Hotel in Worthing and in Parkside, Wimbledon. A bust of Haile Selassie is in nearby Kanazaro Park to commemorate this time and is a popular place of pilgrimage for London's Rastafari community. Haile Selassie stayed at the Abbey Hotel in Malvern in the 1930s and his granddaughters and daughters of court officials were educated at Clarendon School in North Malvern. During his time in Malvern he attended services at Holy Trinity Church, in Link Top. A blue plaque, commemorating his stay in Malvern, was unveiled on Saturday 25 June 2011. As part of the ceremony, a delegation from the Rastafari movement gave a short address and a drum recital. Haile Selassie's activity in this period was focused on countering Italian propaganda as to the state of Ethiopian resistance and the legality of the occupation. He spoke out against the desecration of houses of worship and historical artifacts, including the theft of a 1,600 year old imperial obelisk, and condemned the atrocities suffered by the Ethiopian civilian population. He continued to plead for league intervention and to voice his certainty that God's judgment will eventually visit the weak and the mighty alike. Though his attempts to gain support for the struggle against Italy were largely unsuccessful until Italy entered World War II on the German side in June 1940, the Emperor's pleas for international support did take root in the United States, particularly among African-American organizations sympathetic to the Ethiopian cause. In 1937, Haile Selassie was to give a Christmas Day radio address to the American people to thank his supporters when his taxi was involved in a traffic accident, leaving him with a fractured knee. Rather than cancelling the radio broadcast, he proceeded in much pain to complete the address, in which he linked Christianity and goodwill with the Covenant of the League of Nations, and asserted that, "...war is not the only means to stop war." With the birth of the Son of God, an unprecedented, an unrepeatable, and a long-anticipated phenomenon occurred. He was born in a stable instead of a palace, in a manger instead of a crib. The hearts of the wise men were struck by fear and wonder due to his majestic humbleness. The kings prostrated themselves before him and worshipped him, peace be to those who have goodwill. This became the first message. Although the toils of wise people may earn them respect, it is a fact of life that the spirit of the wicked continues to cast its shadow on this world. The arrogant are seen visibly leading their people into crime and destruction. The laws of the League of Nations are constantly violated and wars and acts of aggression repeatedly take place, so that the spirit of the cursed will not gain predominance over the human race whom Christ redeemed with his blood. All peace-loving people should cooperate to stand firm in order to preserve and promote lawfulness and peace. During this period, Haile Selassie suffered several personal tragedies. His two sons-in-law, Ras Desta Damchu and Dejazmak Bayin Merid, were both executed by the Italians. The emperor's daughter, Princess Romainwork, wife of Dejazmak Bayin Merid, was herself taken into captivity with her children, and she died in Italy in 1941. His daughter Sahai died during childbirth shortly after the restoration in 1942. After his return to Ethiopia, he donated Fairfield House to the city of Bath as a residence for the aged, until modified in the 1990s to be used as a day care center. Advanced negotiations are now proceeding for a community group to run the house to preserve and develop it. 1940s and 1950s British forces, which consisted primarily of Ethiopian-backed African and South African colonial troops under the Gideon Force of Colonel Ord Wingate, coordinated the military effort to liberate Ethiopia. 
The emperor himself issued several imperial proclamations in this period, demonstrating that, while authority was not divided up in any formal way, British military might and the emperor's populist appeal could be joined in the concerted effort to liberate Ethiopia. On 18 January 1941, during the East African Campaign, Haile Selassie crossed the border between Sudan and Ethiopia near the village of Um Idla. The standard of the Lion of Judah was raised again. Two days later, he and a force of Ethiopian patriots joined Gideon force which was already in Ethiopia and preparing the way. Italy was defeated by a force of the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth of Nations, Free France, Free Belgium, and Ethiopian patriots. On 5 May 1941, Haile Selassie entered Addis Ababa and personally addressed the Ethiopian people, five years to the day since his 1936 exile. Today is the day on which we defeated our enemy. Therefore, when we say let us rejoice with our hearts, let not our rejoicing be in any other way but in the Spirit of Christ. Do not return evil for evil. Do not indulge in the atrocities which the enemy has been practicing in his usual way, even to the last. Take care not to spoil the good name of Ethiopia by acts which are worthy of the enemy. We shall see that our enemies are disarmed and sent out the same way they came. As Saint George who killed the dragon is the patron saint of our army as well as of our allies, let us unite with our allies in everlasting friendship and amity in order to be able to stand against the godless and cruel dragon which has newly risen and which is oppressing mankind. On 27 August 1942, Haile Selassie confirmed the legal basis for the abolition of slavery that had been enacted by Italy throughout the empire and imposed severe penalties, including death, for slave trading. After World War II, Ethiopia became a charter member of the United Nations. In 1948, the Agaden, a region disputed with Somalia, was granted to Ethiopia. On 2 December 1950, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 390 v, establishing the Federation of Eritrea the former Italian colony into Ethiopia. Eritrea was to have its own constitution, which would provide for ethnic, linguistic, and cultural balance, while Ethiopia was to manage its finances, defense, and foreign policy. Despite his centralization policies that had been made before World War II, Haile Selassie still found himself unable to push for all the programs he wanted. In 1942, he attempted to institute a progressive tax scheme, but this failed due to opposition from the nobility, and only a flat tax was passed. In 1951, he agreed to reduce this as well. Ethiopia was still semi feudal, and the emperor's attempts to alter its social and economic form by reforming its modes of taxation met with resistance from the nobility and clergy, which were eager to resume their privileges in the post war era. Where Haile Selassie actually did succeed in affecting new land taxes, the burdens were often passed by the landowners to the peasants. Despite his wishes, the tax burden remained primarily on the peasants. Between 1941 and 1959, Haile Selassie worked to establish the autocephaly of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church had been headed by the Abuna, a bishop who answered to the Pope of the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria. In 1942 and 1945 Haile Selassie applied to the Holy Synod of the Coptic Orthodox Church to establish the independence of Ethiopian bishops, and when his appeals were denied he threatened to sever relations with the Coptic Church of Alexandria. Finally, in 1959, Pope Kyrillus VI elevated the Abuna to Patriarch Catholicos. The Ethiopian Church remained affiliated with the Alexandrian Church. In addition to these efforts, Haile Selassie changed the Ethiopian church-state relationship by introducing taxation of church lands, and by restricting the legal privileges of the clergy, who had formerly been tried in their own courts for civil offenses, in keeping with the principle of collective security, for which he was an outspoken proponent, he sent a contingent under General Malagueta Bully, known as the Kagnu Battalion, to take part in the Korean War by supporting the United Nations Command. It was attached to the American 7th Infantry Division, and fought in a number of engagements including the Battle of Pork Chop Hill. In a 1954 speech, the Emperor spoke of Ethiopian participation in the Korean War as a redemption of the principles of collective security. Nearly two decades ago, I personally assumed before history the responsibility of placing the fate of my beloved people on the issue of collective security, for surely, at that time and for the first time in world history, that issue was posed in all its clarity. 
My searching of conscience convinced me of the rightness of my course and if, after untold sufferings and, indeed, unaided resistance at the time of aggression, we now see the final vindication of that principle in our joint action in Korea, I can only be thankful that God gave me strength to persist in our faith until the moment of its recent glorious vindication. During the celebrations of his Silver Jubilee in November 1955, Haile Selassie introduced a revised constitution, whereby he retained effective power, while extending political participation to the people by allowing the lower house of parliament to become an elected body. Party politics were not provided for. Modern educational methods were more widely spread throughout the empire, and the country embarked on a development scheme and plans for modernization, tempered by Ethiopian traditions, and within the framework of the ancient monarchical structure of the state. Haile Selassie compromised when practical with the traditionalists in the nobility and church. He also tried to improve relations between the state and ethnic groups, and granted autonomy to Afar lands that were difficult to control. Still, his reforms to end feudalism were slow and weakened by the compromises he made with the entrenched aristocracy. The revised constitution of 1955 has been criticized for reasserting the indisputable power of the monarch and maintaining the relative powerlessness of the peasants. Haile Selassie also maintained cordial relations with the government of the United Kingdom through charitable gestures. He sent aid to the British government in 1947 when Britain was affected by heavy flooding. His letter to Lord Mayork, National Distress Fund, London said, Even though we are busy of helping our people who didn't recover from the crises of the war, we heard that your fertile and beautiful country is devastated by the unusually heavy rain, and your request for aid. Therefore, we are sending small amount of money, about £1,000 through our embassy to show our sympathy and cooperation. He also left his home in exile, Fairfield House, Bath, to the city of Bath for the use of the aged in 1959. 1960s Haile Selassie contributed Ethiopian troops to the United Nations operation in the Congo Peacekeeping Force during the 1960 Congo Crisis, to preserve Congolese integrity, per United Nations Security Council Resolution 143. On 13 December 1960, while Haile Selassie was on a state visit to Brazil, his Imperial Guard forces staged an unsuccessful coup, briefly proclaiming Haile Selassie's eldest son Asfa Wasson as emperor. The coup d'état was crushed by the regular army and police forces. The coup attempt lacked broad popular support, was denounced by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and was unpopular with the army, air force and police. Nonetheless, the effort to depose the emperor had support among students and the educated classes. The coup attempt has been characterized as a pivotal moment in Ethiopian history, the point at which Ethiopians, for the first time questioned the power of the king to rule without the people's consent. Student populations began to empathize with the peasantry and poor, and to advocate on their behalf. The coup spurred Haile Selassie to accelerate reform, which was manifested in the form of land grants to military and police officials. The emperor continued to be a staunch ally of the West, while pursuing a firm policy of decolonization in Africa, which was still largely under European colonial rule. The United Nations conducted a lengthy inquiry regarding the status of Eritrea, with the superpowers each vying for a stake in the state's future. Britain, the administrator at the time, suggested the partition of Eritrea between Sudan and Ethiopia, separating Christians and Muslims. The idea was instantly rejected by Eritrean political parties, as well as the UN. A UN plebiscite voted 46 to 10 to have Eritrea be federated with Ethiopia, which was later stipulated on 2 December 1950 in Resolution 390 v. Eritrea would have its own parliament and administration and would be represented in what had been the Ethiopian parliament and would become the federal parliament. Haile Selassie would have none of European attempts to draft a separate constitution under which Eritrea would be governed, and wanted his own 1955 constitution protecting families to apply in both Ethiopia and Eritrea. In 1961 the 30-year Eritrean struggle for independence began, followed by Haile Selassie's dissolution of the federation and shutting down of Eritrea's parliament. In September 1961, Haile Selassie attended the Conference of Heads of State of Government of Non-Aligned Countries in Belgrade, FPR Yugoslavia. This is considered to be the founding conference of the non-aligned movement. 
In 1961, tensions between independence-minded Eritreans and Ethiopian forces culminated in the Eritrean War of Independence. The emperor declared Eritrea the 14th province of Ethiopia in 1962. The war would continue for 30 years, as first Haile Selassie, then the Soviet-backed junta that succeeded him, attempted to retain Eritrea by force. In 1963, Haile Selassie presided over the formation of the Organization of African Unity OAU, the precursor of the continent-wide African Union o. The new organization would establish its headquarters in Addis Ababa. In May of that year, Haile Selassie was elected as the OAU's first official chairperson, a rotating seat. Along with Modibo Keita of Mali, the Ethiopian leader would later help successfully negotiate the Bamako Accords, which brought an end to the border conflict between Morocco and Algeria. In 1964, Haile Selassie would initiate the concept of the United States of Africa, a proposition later taken up by Muammar Gaddafi. On 4 October 1963, Haile Selassie addressed the General Assembly of the United Nations referring in his address to his earlier speech to the League of Nations, 27 years ago, as Emperor of Ethiopia, I mounted the rostrum in Geneva, Switzerland, to address the League of Nations and to appeal for relief from the destruction which had been unleashed against my defenseless nation, by the fascist invader. I spoke then both to and for the conscience of the world. My words went unheeded, but history testifies to the accuracy of the warning that I gave in 1936. Today, I stand before the world organization which has succeeded to the mantle discarded by its discredited predecessor. In this body is enshrined the principle of collective security which I unsuccessfully invoked at Geneva. Here, in this assembly, reposes the best, perhaps the last, hope for the peaceful survival of mankind. On 25 November 1963, the Emperor was among other heads of state, including France's President Charles de Gaulle, who traveled to Washington, D.C. and attended the funeral of assassinated President John F. Kennedy. In 1966, Haile Selassie attempted to create a modern, progressive tax that included registration of land, which would significantly weaken the nobility. Even with alterations, this law led to a revolt in Gojjam, which was repressed although enforcement of the tax was abandoned. The revolt, having achieved its design in undermining the tax, encouraged other landowners to defy Haile Selassie. While he had fully approved and assured Ethiopia's participation in UN-approved collective security operations, including Korea and Congo, Haile Selassie drew a distinction between it and the non-UN-approved foreign intervention in Indochina, consistently deploring it as needless suffering and calling for the Vietnam War to end on several occasions. At the same time he remained open toward the United States and commended it for making progress with African American civil rights legislation in the 1950s and 1960s, while visiting the U.S. several times during these years. In 1967, he visited Montreal, Canada to open the Ethiopian Pavilion at the Expo 67 World's Fair where he received great acclaim amongst other world leaders there for the occasion. Student unrest became a regular feature of Ethiopian life in the 1960s and 1970s. Marxism took root in large segments of the Ethiopian intelligentsia, particularly among those who had studied abroad and had thus been exposed to radical and left-wing sentiments that were becoming popular in other parts of the globe. Resistance by conservative elements at the imperial court and parliament, and by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, made Haile Selassie's land reform proposals difficult to implement, and also damaged the standing of the government, costing Haile Selassie much of the goodwill he had once enjoyed. This bred resentment among the peasant population. Efforts to weaken unions also hurt his image. As these issues began to pile up, Haile Selassie left much of domestic governance to his prime minister, Akhlulu Habte Wold, and concentrated more on foreign affairs. 1970s Outside of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie continued to enjoy enormous prestige and respect. As the longest-serving head of state in power, he was often given precedence over other leaders at state events, such as the state funerals of John F. Kennedy and Charles de Gaulle, the summits of the Non-Aligned Movement, and the 1971 celebration of the 2,500 years of the Persian Empire. In 1970 he visited Italy as a guest of President Giuseppe Saragot, and in Milan he met Giordano Delamore, president of Italian Savings Banks Association. 
He visited China in October 1971, and was the first foreign head of state to meet Mao Zedong following the death of Mao's designated successor Lin Biao in a plane crash in Mongolia. Human rights in Ethiopia under Selassie's regime were poor. Civil liberties and political rights were low with Freedom House giving Ethiopia a not free score for both civil liberties and political rights in the last years of Selassie's rule. Common human right abuses included imprisonment and torture of political prisoners and very poor prison conditions. The Ethiopian army also carried out a number of these atrocities while fighting the Eritrean separatists. This was due to a policy of destroying Eritrean villages that supported the rebels. There were a number of mass killings of hundreds of civilians during the war in the late 1960s and early 70s. Topic. Wallow famine. Famine—mostly in Wallo, northeastern Ethiopia, as well as in some parts of Tigray—is estimated to have killed 40,000 to 80,000 Ethiopians between 1972 and 1974. A BBC News report has cited a 1973 estimate that 200,000 deaths occurred, based on a contemporaneous estimate from the Ethiopian Nutrition Institute. While this figure is still repeated in some texts and media sources, it was an estimate that was later found to be over pessimistic. Although the region is infamous for recurrent crop failures and continuous food shortage and starvation risk, this episode was remarkably severe. A 1973 production of the ITV program The Unknown Famine by Jonathan Dimbleby relied on the unverified estimate of 200,000 dead, stimulating a massive influx of aid while at the same time destabilizing Haile Selassie's regime. Against that background, a group of dissident army officers instigated a creeping coup against the emperor's faltering regime. To guard against a public backlash in favor of Haile Selassie, who was still widely revered, they contrived to obtain a copy of the unknown famine which they intercut with images of Africa's grand old man presiding at a wedding feast in the grounds of his palace. Retitled The Hidden Hunger, this film noir was shown round the clock on Ethiopian television to coincide with the day that they finally summoned the nerve to seize the emperor himself. Some reports suggest that the emperor was unaware of the extent of the famine, while others assert that he was well aware of it. In addition to the exposure of attempts by corrupt local officials to cover up the famine from the imperial government, the Kremlin's depiction of Haile Selassie's Ethiopia as backwards and inept relative to the purported utopia of Marxism-Leninism contributed to the popular uprising that led to its downfall and the rise of Mengistu Haile Mariam. The famine and its image in the media undermined popular support of the government, and Haile Selassie's once unassailable personal popularity fell. The crisis was exacerbated by military mutinies and high oil prices, the latter a result of the 1973 oil crisis. The international economic crisis triggered by the oil crisis caused the costs of imported goods, gasoline, and food to skyrocket, while unemployment spiked. Topic. Revolution. In February 1974, four days of serious riots in Addis Ababa against a sudden economic inflation left five dead. The emperor responded by announcing on national television a reduction in petrol prices and a freeze on the cost of basic commodities. This calmed the public, but the promised 33% military wage hike was not substantial enough to pacify the army, which then mutinied, beginning in Asmara and spreading throughout the empire. This mutiny led to the resignation of Prime Minister Akalu Habte Wold on 27 February 1974. Haile Selassie again went on television to agree to the army's demands for still greater pay, and named Ndelkachu Makanan as his new Prime Minister. Despite Ndelkachu's many concessions, discontent continued in March with a four-day general strike that paralyzed the nation. Topic. Imprisonment. The DERG, a committee of low-ranking military officers and enlisted men, set up in June to investigate the military's demands, took advantage of the government's disarray to depose the 82-year-old Selassie on September 12. General Amon Michael Andam, a Protestant of Eritrean origin, served briefly as provisional head of state pending the return of Crown Prince Asfa Wasson, who was then receiving medical treatment abroad. Selassie was placed under house arrest briefly at the 4th Army Division in Addis Ababa, while most of his family was detained at the late Duke of Harar's residence in the north of the capital. 
The last months of the emperor's life were spent in imprisonment, in the Grand Palace. Reportedly, his mental condition was such that he believed he was still emperor of Ethiopia. Later, most of the imperial family was imprisoned in the Addis Ababa prison Kershel, also known as Alem Bekane, or I've Had Enough of This World. On November 23, 60 former high officials of the imperial government were executed by firing squad without trial, which included Selassie's grandson Iskinder Desta, a rear admiral, as well as General Andam and two former prime ministers. These killings, known to Ethiopians as Bloody Saturday, were condemned by Crown Prince Asfa Wasson. The Derg responded to his rebuke by revoking its acknowledgement of his imperial legitimacy and announcing the end of the Solomonic dynasty. Topic. Death and interment On 28 August 1975, the state media reported that the ex-monarch Haile Selassie had died on 27 August of respiratory failure, following complications from a prostate examination followed up by a prostate operation. His doctor, Azret Waldeis, denied that complications had occurred and rejected the government version of his death. In 1994, three years after the military socialist Derg regime was overthrown, an Ethiopian court found several former military officers guilty of cruelly strangling the emperor in his bed. Charging the suspected assailants with genocide and murder, the Ethiopian court claimed that it had obtained documents attesting to a high-level order from the military regime to assassinate Emperor Haile Selassie for leading a feudal regime. Document sources showing the Derg's final assassination order, bearing the military regime's seal and signature, have been widely circulated online. The veracity of the content in these documents has been corroborated by multiple former members of the military Derg regime. The Soviet-backed Derg fell in 1991. In 1992, the emperor's bones were found under a concrete slab on the palace grounds. Some reports suggest that his remains were discovered beneath a latrine. For almost a decade thereafter, as Ethiopian courts attempted to sort out the circumstances of his death, his coffin rested in Bata Church, near his great-uncle Menelik II's resting place. On 5 November 2000, Haile Selassie was given an imperial-style funeral by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The post-communist government refused calls to declare the ceremony an official imperial funeral, although such prominent Rastafari figures as Rita Marley and others participated in the grand funeral, most Rastafari rejected the event and refused to accept that the bones were the remains of Haile Selassie. There remains some debate within the Rastafari movement whether Haile Selassie actually died in 1975. Topic. Descendants. By Menon Asfa, Haile Selassie had six children, Princess Tenenwerk, Crown Prince Asfa Wasson, Princess Zenobwerk, Princess Sahai, Prince Makanan, and Prince Sahil Selassie. There is some controversy as to the motherhood of Haile Selassie's eldest daughter, Princess Romainwerk. While the living members of the royal family state that Romainwerk is the eldest daughter of Empress Menon, it has been asserted that Princess Romainwerk is actually the daughter of a previous union of the emperor with Woiziro Altayech. This may be a nickname she used, as nobleman Blatta Merce Hazen Wald Kirkos, a contemporary source prominent in both the imperial court and the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church names her as Woiziro Woinetu Amid. The emperor's own autobiography makes no mention of this previous marriage or having fathered children with anyone other than Empress Menon, although he mentions the death of this daughter in captivity at Turin. Other sources such as Blatta Merce Hazen Wald Kirkos mentions Princess Romainwerk's mother Woiziro Woinetu Amid as attending the wedding of her daughter to Dejazmach Bayin Merid in a first-hand account in his book about the years before the Italian occupation. Prince Asfa Wasson was first married to Princess Wolit Israel Sayum and then following their divorce to Princess Medfariashwar Khabib. Prince Makanan was married to Princess Sarah Jiza. Prince Sahil Selassie was married to Princess Mahisant Habte Mariam. Princess Romainwerk married Dejazmach Bayin Marid. Princess Tenenwerk first married Ras Desta Damchu, and after she was widowed later married Ras Andargachu Mesai. Princess Zenobwerk married Dejazmach Haile Selassie Gugza. Princess Sahai married Lieutenant General Abia Abib. Rastafari Messiah 
Today, Haile Selassie is worshipped as God incarnate among followers of the Rastafari movement taken from Haile Selassie's pre-imperial name Ras, meaning head, a title equivalent to Duke, Tafari Makanan, which emerged in Jamaica during the 1930s under the influence of Leonard Howell, a follower of Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism movement. He is viewed as the Messiah who will lead the peoples of Africa and the African diaspora to freedom. His official titles are Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah and King of Kings of Ethiopia and Elect of God, and his traditional lineage is thought to be from Solomon and Sheba. These notions are perceived by Rastafari as confirmation of the return of the Messiah in the prophetic book of Revelation in the New Testament, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, and Root of David. Rastafari faith in the incarnate divinity of Haile Selassie began after news reports of his coronation reached Jamaica, particularly via the two Time magazine articles on the coronation the week before and the week after the event. Haile Selassie's own perspectives permeate the philosophy of the movement. In 1961, the Jamaican government sent a delegation composed of both Rastafari and non Rastafari leaders to Ethiopia to discuss the matter of repatriation, among other issues, with the emperor. He reportedly told the Rastafari delegation which included Mortimer Plano, "...tell the brethren to be not dismayed, I personally will give my assistance in the matter of repatriation." Haile Selassie visited Jamaica on 21 April 1966, and approximately 100,000 Rastafari from all over Jamaica descended on Palisados Airport in Kingston, having heard that the man whom they considered to be their messiah was coming to visit them. Spliffs and chalices were openly smoked, causing a haze of ganja smoke, to drift through the air. Haile Selassie arrived at the airport but was unable to come down the mobile steps of the airplane, as the crowd rushed the tarmac. He then returned into the plane, disappearing for several more minutes. Finally, Jamaican authorities were obliged to request Ross Mortimer Plano, a well-known Rasta leader, to climb the steps, enter the plane, and negotiate the emperor's descent. Plano re-emerged and announced to the crowd. The Emperor has instructed me to tell you to be calm. Step back and let the Emperor land. This day is widely held by scholars to be a major turning point for the movement, and it is still commemorated by Rastafari as Graunation Day, the anniversary of which is celebrated as the second holiest holiday after the 2nd of November, the Emperor's Coronation Day. From then on, as a result of Plano's actions, the Jamaican authorities were asked to ensure that Rastafari representatives were present at all state functions attended by the emperor, and Rastafari elders also ensured that they obtained a private audience with the emperor, where he reportedly told them that they should not emigrate to Ethiopia until they had first liberated the people of Jamaica. This dictum came to be known as, "...liberation before repatriation." Haile Selassie defied expectations of the Jamaican authorities and never rebuked the Rastafari for their belief in him as the returned Jesus. Instead, he presented the movement's faithful elders with gold medallions, the only recipients of such an honor on this visit. During PNP leader later Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley's visit to Ethiopia in October 1969, the emperor allegedly still recalled his 1966 reception with amazement, and stated that he felt that he had to be respectful of their beliefs. This was the visit when Manley received the Rod of Correction or Rod of Joshua as a present from the emperor, which is thought to have helped him to win the 1972 election in Jamaica. Rita Marley, Bob Marley's wife, converted to the Rastafari faith after seeing Haile Selassie on his Jamaican trip. She claimed in interviews and in her book No Woman, No Cry that she saw a stigmata print on the palm of Haile Selassie's hand as he waved to the crowd which resembled the markings on Christ's hands from being nailed to the cross. A claim that was not supported by other sources, but was used as evidence for her and other Rastafari to suggest that Haile Selassie I was indeed their messiah. She was also influential in the conversion of Bob Marley, who then became internationally recognized. As a result, Rastafari became much better known throughout much of the world. Bob Marley's posthumously released song, Iron Lion Zion, refers to Haile Selassie. Topic. Selassie's position In a 1967 recorded interview Haile Selassie appeared to deny his alleged divinity. In the interview Bill McNeil says, There are millions of Christians throughout the world, your imperial majesty, who regard you as the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Selassie replied in his native language, I have heard of that idea. I also met certain Rastafarians. 
I told them clearly that I am a man, that I am mortal, and that I will be replaced by the oncoming generation, and that they should never make a mistake in assuming or pretending that a human being is emanated from a deity. For many Rastafari the CBC interview is not interpreted as a denial of his divinity, and according to Robert Earl Hood, Haile Selassie neither denied nor affirmed his divinity either way. In Reggae Roots, the story of Jamaican music, Kevin Chong and Wayne Chen note. It's often said, though no definite date is ever cited, that Haile Selassie himself denied his divinity. Former senator and Gleaner editor, Hector Winter, tells of asking him, during his visit to Jamaica in 1966, when he was going to tell Rastafari he was not God. Who am I to disturb their belief? replied the emperor. After his return to Ethiopia, he dispatched Archbishop Abuna Yesahak Mandafro to the Caribbean to help draw Rastafari and other West Indians to the Ethiopian Church and, according to some sources, denied his divinity. In 1948, Haile Selassie donated a piece of land at Shashamane, 250 km south of Addis Ababa, for the use of people of African descent from the West Indies. Numerous Rastafari families settled there and still live as a community to this day. Topic. Titles and styles The 23rd of July 1892 to 1 November 1905, Lij Tafari Makanan The 1st of November 1905 to 8 September 1911, Dejazmak Tafari Makanan The 8th of September 1911 to 7 October 1928, Ras Tafari Makanan the 7th of October 1928 to the 2nd of November 1930, Negus Tafari Makanan. The 2nd of November 1930 to the 12th of September 1974, His Imperial Majesty the King of Kings of Ethiopia, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, Elect of God. Topic: <laughs> National Orders. Chief Commander of the Order of the Star of Ethiopia, 1909. Grand Cordon of the Order of Solomon 1930 Grand Collar of the Order of the Seal of Solomon Grand Cordon of the Order of the Queen of Sheba Grand Cordon of the Order of the Holy Trinity Ethiopia Grand Cordon of the Order of Menelik II Topic Ancestry Topic Military ranks Haile Selassie held the following ranks Field Marshal, Imperial Ethiopian Army Admiral of the Fleet, Imperial Ethiopian Navy Marshal of the Imperial Ethiopian Air Force Field Marshal, British Army, 20 January 1965 Topic. Popular culture William Saroyan wrote a short story about him entitled The Lion of Judah in his 1971 book, Letters from 74 Rue Tatebout or Don't Go But If You Must Say Hello to Everybody. His name is often called out in vain by Hermes Conrad, a Rastafarian accountant from the show Futurama. Featured as a playable leader in the computer strategy game Civilization V, Brave New World, Rex Stewart, a jazz cornetist, thought about Haile Selassie when he was creating a tune named Menelik the Lion of Judah, which was recorded in 1941. Propagandi's 1993 debut album, How to Clean Everything, features a song called Haile Selassie, Up Your Ass, a bitter attack on religious conflicts in the Middle East and the Rastafari movement. Band Zabranjano Pusenje wrote a song about him entitled, Hajli Selassieg, featuring on their album, Fields and Visca. From 1997. The band Ween referenced Haile Selassie in their song Mutilated Lips on their 1997 album The Mollusk. The band Bright Eyes feature a song on their album The People's Key entitled, Haile Selassie. In 2008, a full length feature film dedicated to Haile Selassie, Man of the Millennium, was produced by an Ethiopian filmmaker Tikar Tafara Kadane of Exodus Films, in collaboration with an Alaskan TV station Tanana Valley TV and Fourth Avenue Films. In paying homage to the late emperor, Lupe Fiasco released a track titled Haile Selassie on 24 October 2014. The song's theme centers on equality and justice. Selassie and Rastafarian are mentioned in a lyric from Skepta's 2015 song, Shut Down.
is seen as the leader of Ethiopia in Hearts of Iron IV. See also Black Lions Desta Damchu List of people who have been considered deities Topic Notes Topic Footnotes Topic Citations Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading Topic External links <laughs>